Good evening all and welcome to another installment in our series where we talk about leadership issues. My name is Marjorie Wharton and joining me this evening as always for these discussions is Sonia Lane. Hi Sonia. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and so we are here to talk about the issue, one of the issues that we find interesting um, as part of our practice as leadership coaches, as trainers, as transition specialists and change managers, there are often many issues that we find affecting organizations in the Caribbean, in the U.S. or around the world. And so every time we do one of these sessions, we identify a topic that we find of interest and we come to talk about it because we are considering really how it affects organizations in the Caribbean region, in the US or around the world. And really what do we as leaders need to do about it in order to be most effective in our roles as leaders? And so our topic today is this question, are employees hiding their skills from employers? So what do you think about our topic, Sonia? I love it because I am saying, yes, of course, they're hiding their skills. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I love I love this topic because I hope hopefully it will bring more attention to it. And let's talk about why. Um, yeah. What does that mean for employers when employees hide their their skill sets? What does it mean for employees and um, what impact that has and how we can address it? Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with you. It's a very interesting topic. And so this was one that you found that you selected in you where you were doing your readings and your research. And really, when you shared it with me, I agreed with you that I thought it was something that we should be talking about. Because on some level, I'm sure we've heard people in organizations say something that helps us to know that this is not just an isolated incident, one, and two, it's not something that's a new phenomena. I, I am sure I can remember people in organizations saying, well, I'm not doing that. They don't pay me for that. Or I don't have to, to tell them that I have done this because, you know, that is a part of my job description. And so we tend to see that happening. And I think where we want to go with our discussion today is really what causes it, what is con helping it to continue going on why hasn't mm. it gone away as yet and then what can we do in order to get it to to be something that we're addressing now and hopefully really tackling once and for all so mm -hmm. maybe we, let's start with what causes what do you think causes that employees to be in that state where they may be having skills that they're hiding from their employers mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't think they're intentionally hiding. I think what happens is they come into an organization, they have a whole host of skills, and it even starts with the, you know, the resume. When you're applying for a job, what do they tell you? Uh, best practice says you remove any um, skill sets that you don't think is inherently necessary to get the job. You come into the organization and, and people are pigeonholed into whatever box they're placing within the organization and told to stay there. And sometimes it's not overt, but it's subtle. This is uh, where you are and this is where we expect you to be. And, um, and organizations, unless they have a really good HR department who is developing leaders to understand that they have to look and really see the holistic nature of the employees, get to know them so that they can pull out these um, additional skill sets, they will just languish there without the organization utilizing them. And we see this as coaches because how often do we have to exhort our, um, our um, coaches to you know, take the initiative and step ahead mm -hmm. and move forward and, and let people know that you're interested and you have these skills because everything within the organization says the systems, the processes stay where you are. And yeah. so as a result, employees are not one to continuously raise their hand and say, hey, I can, you know, do that. Yeah. They're, they're left. And of yeah. course, they're, it's ironic, they're, they feel under-resourced, they feel overwhelmed. 
But the key thing is if you bring in all these other skills, it will help the organization with the creativity, the innovation, the efficiency that they need. So it's like almost like a vicious circle. Yeah. It's, it's what I think. Yeah, I think though that in some instances, there are instances where it is a deliberate choice by an employee not to bring in a skill that's not, just as you say, sometimes the system does not encourage it, but then there is a choice by the employee because the system isn't encouraging it, they're not going to push the envelope and ask, they're not going to volunteer, they're not going to go beyond because the system is built in such a way that you're only getting rewarded for what is in your job description. And so sometimes it can feel almost like you're being quote unquote exploited. Or maybe mm. I don't need to put that in quotations. Sometimes yeah. there are people who feel like they're being exploited because they may have a skill or a capability. It's not really their job, but because they know how to do it, they keep getting asked for it. And there's no reward for the extra effort or extra work that they're putting out. That is true. I was actually thinking that sometimes employers don't encourage it because what it may do is add to it. It creates issues with the compensation and reward that they don't want to take on, which is yeah. why I started by saying, if you have a great HR department and leaders then you will realize that it's an investment that you're missing out on, that yes. it, it, it's a short-term solution that you're paying a cost for. There's a yeah. price to be paid for not maximizing and pulling out and utilizing all the skills that employees have to answer, yeah. have to offer. Yeah, now, I agree hmm. with you there. Yeah. I agree with you that the, because what popped into my head as you were saying that is that leaders, the, the managers, the team leader, the supervisor has to be in a position to pull out, draw out, encourage, and then have some way or some flexibility to reward. Even sometimes if it is just that you are recognizing the fact that the person mm -hmm. has gone above and beyond what is expected of them. I mean, that's not always the answer because sometimes people really do want to get money. But a lot of people are willing to do more if they feel appreciated for the yes. extra effort that they have put out. That they have put in. And mm -hmm. so there are two things. I don't want to give the impression that not all organ all organizations are just allowing this to happen. It's happening mm -hmm. in every organization, but so for example, but but some organizations are doing something about that. So for mm -hmm. example, last year I had two organizations who um, took my take the initiative workshop. They wanted their employees to understand how do you go about taking initiative and volunteering to say, hey, I can do that. It's needed and I can do that. So there are organizations, there are leaders, there are HR departments out there that who are who are saying to their people, we want to know, and here's how you should go about doing it. Because obviously there has to be some sort of way because there could be unintended consequences if everybody's out there raising their hands mm -hmm. and neglecting their jobs because, hey, this seems more exciting and more glamorous than, than what I'm currently doing. <laughs> and... <laughs> And so there are legitimate concerns from, from, from employers as well. Can they take on more? How would that look? And so there are um, employers who say, hey, I want you to come in. I want you to train people. I want you to, I want to know how do you know that you need to take initiative? And how do you, and here's a process for doing that. On the other hand, you have um, employers who don't necessarily who aren't doing that, but mm. who need employees to take the initiative. <laughs> and this is where the cost is. This is where it, it, it's happening. So it's, it's a, a funny situation where you have to figure out, well, obviously ask the question, are there, are there, if you're a leader out there, you're thinking, are there people on my team who have skills that I don't know about? Yes. The answer is yes, categorically. And I, you know, we go to ourselves and think, no, I know these people, but no. Um, and then the second thing would be, how would I go about getting them to to, to tell me and how would I go about ensuring that they are able to, there's an efficient and effective process for them to apply mm -hmm. these new skills. Okay. Well, I like the fact that you've taken it there because you've kind of gone ahead then to the solution or some suggestions around the solution. 
Oh, no, because then, no, 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 don't come back. I think that's a great place for us to go because I think we know what the problem is to some extent. And I think that that brings us then to maybe start talking about what is it that leaders could be doing and should be doing in order to get beyond where they think they are. Because I agree mm -hmm. with you that the there are times when the system some organizations will have systems that will allow their in, their people to take initiative. They will try to f create structures that allow them to do it in a structured way. There are some organizations that we know reward people for entrepreneurial ideas. So you come up with a good idea in the business that is going to help the business make money or save money, and you are rewarded and you're recognized for that. But then there are a lot more that aren't doing that. And so they're not encouraging the initiative. Yes. They're not encouraging people to think differently. They're not encouraging them to do things differently or to apply skills that they have gained. And so we wind up then in a situation where a lot of employees are frustrated. And mm -hmm. And I really think that it is up to leaders to get to know their people, not just, as you say, pretend that they know them, but actually get to yeah. know their people. And any leader who is not fully aware of what their team members can do, then you are failing your team members and you're failing yourself as a leader. So it means that you have to have conversations on a consistent basis to understand what your people are doing, what they're interested in, what they're capable of doing. And, and, shift around that those responsibilities as much as you can while i hear the concern that you mentioned sonia that you can have people you have organizations who are worried that if people are finding other things more exciting they might not be doing their substantive role mm -hmm. if the substantive role is one that is not bringing out the best to the employee then we have to have some structure in the organization that allows us to look at the job I I um I totally agree with that. And I would say you are failing your employees and also you are not paying attention mm. because when you go into organizations, you know, there's some people who are like stars. There's, you know, the, the, these are the people that I know I can rely on. They perform really well. And then what leaders tend to do is they put all the work on them. You know, the reward for good work is more work. Yeah. And their star players get overwhelmed and, and burnt out. And then you hear them saying, oh, I, I don't want to take on a leadership role because I, I just don't want any more. As mm -hmm. opposed to you looking at your team and figuring out how you can spread it. And I like to say, if if you want to know if any of your team members have skills that you are that you don't know about, look at the underperforming ones. Mm. the ones who are not performing at their best because if you spend time any you know we if you spend time with employees who are not performing you know that they are not placed where they can shine this mm -hmm. is not the environment that they can thrive in and then your job as a, a leader is to figure out well how can i unite what figure out what are they good at what what is what is the one thing they're extremely good at and find mm. that so that you can then build off of that. And so that's a really great place to start. If you have a good, if you have team members that are not performing well, then they have some skill sets that you may, you may not be aware of. Obviously not all, um, yeah. because you know, there are some people that it's better, they, they're square peg in a round hole. So it's best yeah. people go somewhere else and thrive and fly. Or as yeah. I like to say, your 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 duck among eagles, go find water. You, you know belong up here. Or your eagle among ducks. Ooh, vice versa. Harsh. But that's where the, the real <laughs> I know that's a lot of analogy. But to say <laughs> that if you have some person who you know look and see what other skills they may have that they're not showing because that has worked for me where you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know you were great at that. You suck mm -hmm. at this, but here, you're, this is so much value for you. Yeah. And it sometimes means that you have to be willing to give an employee a chance to do something that is beyond what is simply in their job description. And if you are building a rapport with your employees, if you are getting to know them and they feel comfortable enough, then they will come to you and talk to you about this thing that they know how to do and the suggestion that they can make and the idea that they may have. And they're more likely to be willing to do something that is beyond their job description because 
they are working collectively with you. And this is really a good manifestation of employee engagement. If you have a situation where your employees have skills and they are not volunteering, they're not contributing, they're basically watching you over there struggling while they know how to do it, then you know that your employees are actively disengaged with what is going on in the organization. Because employees who are engaged are employees who see themselves as part of the whole and part of the team. And so they are more likely to be willing to offer advice, to get involved, to speak up, to make a suggestion, whether it is within their job description or not. Mm -hmm. So if you have this going on in your organization, you as the leader needs to work at getting your employees to be more engaged. Yeah. And, and that's a great way of getting them engaged. Now, some some leaders might say they have the opposite problem. They have people who are mm -hmm. constantly telling them about their <laughs> other skills rather than the ones that they're they're doing. And that's still great. You can help them get into that area and, mm -hmm. and, and it help them on their way out. But it's really in, in important that you figure it out because one of the first things I always say to leaders who say, oh, this employee is not performing up to, to, you know, they're not performing up to standard is you've got to find at least one thing they do really well. Yeah. That's the first thing you have to do. You have to pay attention and figure out where, what do they do well and then build from there. And this will be a great way, which leads into job crafting, you know, figuring out like... You know, I get people who are leading um, younger generation who after two years want to know, well, where am I going? Yeah. Well, they like to exaggerate and say mm -hmm. after six months they come in and want to have that conversation of where am I going? But I feel yeah. it's an exaggeration. But Yeah, it's probably, you're know, right. It's probably more like three years. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, like two, they want to know where are they going? What are they going to be doing? And sometimes they're doing and performing excellently. And they just need some sort of utilization of their skills, as you're saying. And this is a great way to keep them invested and interested by figuring out, well, what other skills do you have? Where do you develop? What, what have you developed? And that we can craft a job, you know, that looks and works for you together. Mm -hmm. And so this, again, is another wonderful opportunity that um, leaders are leaving on the table to help in today's world where it's just, um, it's, it's a world filled with opportunities, but you need certain skills to tap into those opportunities and exploit them for growth. Mm -hmm. And you have to be maximizing every single thing you have at work. And that means really paying attention to your people because your people are the ones that are going to do it for you and sitting down and knowing them. So when you see this research that says they're just sitting there, you know, and they're not giving everything they have to the organization. And as you say, that's because they're not engaged. Um, we, and then you're having limited resources, your resources are going away, but your targets are still growing. Then this is an area where people can really tap into to sort of ease your life as a leader. And so I'm, I'm not shocked, but I'm still shocked that people are not exploiting it as it should be, as a great way to um, do more with, yeah. you know, the same resources. Yeah. And it really brings us then to the point, as you mentioned, job design, to a recognition that we have to face that maybe a lot of the jobs as they are now in organizations, and this is part of the discussion that you hear a lot when people talk about the future of work, a lot of jobs as they are designed now are not necessarily what they need to be, what the organization needs, what can be most valuable to the organization now, given the technology that's available, given the other resources that may be available. There are still a lot of uh, maybe pedantic or simple tasks, low-level tasks that we are asking high-level knowledge workers to perform 
that perhaps can be automated and be done by machines. But the way we are thinking about work right now is not allowing that to happen. And so there are a lot of people at work who are underemployed. And the research in that study and in that article that we saw stated that a lot of the people were underemployed and they did not feel that there was any opportunity for them to progress in the organizations they were in. And so to them, it didn't make any sense you know, trying, they didn't feel like there was any use for the skills that they had. And so a lot of the times why they weren't pushing the fact that they had these skills was they didn't feel that they were needed. And the opposite I mean, is true. They are needed. They're just not being asked for. I mean, can you imagine you're sitting there? Everyone is saying I'm so overwhelmed, but in reality, you're so overwhelmed because you don't have people in the right spots. And, and, and there's certain things that to me, maybe they, there may be certain tasks that to me are very tedious and I don't want to do them. But to you, they're, you can go to town on them yeah. and they're, they're, fa they're fabulous. They're, they're right in your wheelhouse. For me, it's, they're extremely difficult for me to do. And so it's, it's really important that you know your people and create that environment where they feel that you can, they, yeah. they can tell you what it is because again, we have limited resources, so we can't compensate everyone for the new skill that they're bringing to the table. But if we can rearrange and, and, and redesign tasks and, and, and distribute them in a way where everyone, I have something that's new, that's exciting for me mm -hmm. and without increasing, because, you know, that's the first thing leaders were thinking in this, you know, people are thinking about recession is coming. We don't have these resources. People are restructuring. This is a wonderful way of doing it, but you have to put in the energy and the, the, the effort because as you say, people don't want to work for free. And, mm -hmm. and if you can't say to an employee in today's world, it's not about the upward trajectory. It's about doing meaningful work. It's mm -hmm. about crafting a role that when I come to work, I am really invested in my, it allows me to grow. It allows me to demonstrate how I perform. It allows me to learn. It allows me to develop in ways that I never thought. Then that in itself is something that I can commit to as an mm -hmm. employee. And that's what employees want. They want the that growth, that development. Meaningful work. Meaningful work that stretches them, but not too much. Mm -hmm. That stretches them to the right point. Mm -hmm. You know, to that point where, yes, this is this this tension is good and, and it allows me to grow and not stretches them where they break. Yeah. And um, so this is a great way for you to give them that, which is when someone comes to you, say, where, where am I growing? Where am I developing? How can I get up there? And you will say, well, there's not enough room up there. But and that's that's yesterday's world. But what I can do for you is to help yeah. you figure out how to grow and develop in a way that you that allows you to show how good you are yeah. and pulls the best out of you and, and help you contribute to something. And this is why leaders should be really upset when they see these, um, these, these feedback. And, you know, just about two weeks ago, I saw a, a survey that also shows that people come to work about half of the people who are at work, hide something about themselves personally from their employees mm. we assume it's so they can fit in they don't think that it will be accepted at on the job so there's something about themselves that they they hide because they don't think this will be accepted on the job and i always think again this you you you, you in order to maximize and get the best of the employees in order to be as collaborative as as um to be agile to be innovative people have to be bringing their whole selves to work. So not spending time hiding things because yeah. that takes energy. And um, you want people to feel that sense of belonging. And that gives you, I mean, the research shows it, that gives you the entire freedom and, and creativity that people need to come to work and help you. And so mm -hmm. I'm not surprised where, when we hear people can't find people Mm -hmm. there, there's a you know a dearth of um qualified people they're they're looking for that they can't find them it's like they're right under your nose and you're ignoring them so that's mm -hmm. when you can't find them i am not surprised when i hear um 
organizational leaders or the CEO say, oh, I'm worried about our ability to collaborate and be innovative and to be agile, which is needed now. I'm not surprised when they say we're worried about how we're going to navigate the future because these types of research, this type of information explains why they say that, mm -hmm. um, why they say that. And then what it means is there's an answer there in the information. So it's not something that is like, oh, what do we do? Well, it's clear what we do. Mm -hmm. um, you just need to prioritize it and, um, and put a process in place. Yeah, and start actually working with that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've talked then about the fact that in some instances, we need to be looking at job design. We need to be taking into account what is it employees are interested in, what they're capable of. And we need to be looking at ways to not necessarily um, give more compensation, but maybe redesign what we're asking them to do so that they are really being compensated for high value work that can help the organization to be competitive. And give more compensation because CEO compensation has gone astronomically high. So the money is there. So it's time to, for, for, so let me just be clear. Yes. Give more compensation, pay, pay people what they're worth. And this is why, as you said, you, you alluded to it. That's why people don't volunteer the information because yeah. quite rightfully they're saying, if you're not going to pay me, then I'm not going to do it for you. And they should say that. They okay. should absolutely should say that. And so I, I, I will not say don't pay them because when you look at the compensation for leadership, um, it, it has grown extremely high. So you, you have money to pay people. Okay. Just going to say Just that. in case there are any CEOs listening, I'm sure they might disagree. <laughs> well, maybe not theirs, but the research has shown that in many organizations, the pay for senior executives uh, is always found, let's say, is always found. And so it may be lower levels in the organization. That and it has gone not, higher. Yeah, yes. I saw some being, yeah. re re report on it. I didn't even bother to read it because I'm like, well, yes. And I'm not saying that they don't deserve their pay, mm -hmm. but it has gone. It's, it's now like, so before where it was like, you know, when it, you compare it to what their employees are earning, it is like astronomical. So I don't okay. think it is. All right. Well, we are not encouraging rioting in the streets. The statistics that Sonia, you are speaking about, I assume, are those global statistics? Are those from any particular part of the world? Are those oh, for Caribbean gosh. organizations? We just don't want that, you know, people in territories of the Caribbean to assume that that applies to them just in case it does not. It applies everywhere. We all okay. know that too. All so right. I'm not saying, you know, go and overpay <laughs> people now. I am saying put a system in place where the value, when people demonstrate Absolutely. value to the bottom line, yeah. And, 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 you know, where they that definitely demonstrate that they are amplifying yeah. your growth, that they are rewarded in, in such way. But it's not like, yeah. oh, let's just I pay agree. people more all over. No, I'm like, yes, right. because and then you will, that reward, yes, that behavior yeah. will be, will be uh, of repeated. Course. And so I'm agreeing with you because then what we are ultimately saying is as organizations, you want to figure out how to earn more money. You want to figure out how to be sustainable and get sustainable competitive advantage. Always it exists in the collection of employees in the organization, their skill, their knowledge and what they can do. And so you need to develop ways to unleash that capability for the benefit of the organization. So what, what perhaps are uh, maybe some of the steps that, that we would say employees should be taking in order to put themselves in a the best position to really utilize their skills, unleash their skills, get opportunities to use their skills in better ways. One of the things I always say to um, people that I'm working with, I always say you have to be willing to speak up and you have to be willing to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are those out there who have said, well, me, not me. They're not paying me anymore. I'm not doing anymore. But you may sometimes find that you can volunteer to be a part of a committee to do a project and it can be high profile and it can get you into something else that you are working towards. So you have to be strategic in how you do it when you're speaking up and when you're volunteering. But I believe that sometimes that is a strategy to help yes. you. 
to get to a point where you can utilize, get to use those skills that may not be a part of your job description. Yes. Oh, sorry. We have some comments here, Marjorie. Oh, sorry. The discussion was going well. We are like the, the worst of like, yes. Okay. So some people are saying, I'm thinking, I'm thinking this is a great topic. I'm thinking organizations are not typically designed for change. That is true. That is true. 100%. As a we are both change managers and we say that. So expressing ideas and sharing initiatives imply that change would follow. And since human beings are hardwired for comfort, we prefer not to deal with change. And so mm -hmm. that is so true. And that's why in the organization, you, you understand that and you, you create systems that help them change, to create that drive to mm -hmm. why, why must... Why must I change? How would it benefit me? I, yeah. I put up some questions that we utilize to help people to understand that. And, and so you change or you die. And, and yeah. we have the history of seeing that. And it's really important, especially in these difficult times. Um, Jennifer is saying I trust is the word you're dancing around. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, maybe we were dancing around it. You're right. Trust has a lot to do with it. Because if you don't trust your manager, you're not going to come to them sometimes and talk to them about what you're capable of doing. So that's a good point. So true. Well said. Yes, it is. And let's not talk about, don't wait till trust breaks down to talk about it. You got to talk mm -hmm. to trust. You have to talk, uh, pull up trust all, all, trust. all, all mm -hmm. along. And that's something I discuss with clients because they always we talk about that, you know, with, with, with employees, um, how do we ensure we're getting the best? How do we, you, you got to build trust because that's the goodwill that you work on. Another mm -hmm. one is unfortunately in our com very competitive culture, some employers or supervisors feel threatened by employee skills. Mm. I'll let you handle that one, Marjorie. That's a yes, juicy one. But that, <laughs> I, unfortunately, that is true. But you know what I always say? That does not mean that you should hide your skills. It may mean that you have to be selective when you let it out and you sometimes have to be selective in how because maybe you use it to help the supervisor in something that they're doing or you utilize it in such a way that it, it makes you look good and it makes the supervisor look good. But it does not mean that you should pretend that you're not capable when you are just because somebody else is going to be uncomfortable with it. And then, of course, you know, um, what Sonia and I always say, especially on our other um, program where we talk about the wisdom without the wounds, without the wounds. <laughs> where we always say that you may come to a point where you find you and that supervisor have to part ways. Because if you are so uncomfortable, where, as we heard before, you don't have trust with that person, you're so uncomfortable, you can't talk about the skills that you can bring to the table and the different things that you can do. That is not going to be a comfortable environment for you to grow and thrive in. So as hard as it might be to hear, it might be one that you want to part company with. Yeah. And first of all, you have to identify when you have a, a, a leader who's like that. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we don't. We just try, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and their leader basically said, you can't go anywhere. You can't go to any meetings. You can't mm -hmm. attend any training. They were like building a wall around <laughs> the employee because, and I'm like, well, this is, this is, this is pure. They feel so threatened, and they're 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 yeah. telegraphing it in a in the biggest in way, not so even subtle. Well, subtle, that way. Even subtle way. And yeah. they those types of leaders cost employer employers and organizations so much money. So that's yeah. another thing. You know, you gotta look at what type of leaders you have because they are costing you. You know, for for executive teams, sometimes they feel like they're climbing up a hill and it can't it, it's because your leaders are not good we, again we go back to you need a great hr department that is training and developing leaders how mm -hmm. to manage change and how to deal with change how to build trust how to ensure that you build a um you need people who are smarter than you on your team you need people who are highly skilled because your job is still to facilitate them and and ensure that they're all ruined in alignment. Yeah. Not to shut them down because you feel they're going to take your job. And that tells me right away that you are not capable and competent because you should be growing and developing and creating a way that you want them to take your job because you have some place else. Dear God. Yes. Oh God. 
<laughs> and there is nothing, absolutely nothing better as a leader than having somebody working with you who you know that tomorrow, if you don't, you can't do what needs to be God done. God forbid you win the lottery. You get them to do it. You you know you it, can leave. It don't, it don't even have to be that exotic. But let's say that there's a great opportunity, a great project you can work on. Your boss cannot allow you to go work on that because there's nobody to take your place. Exactly. That's but another if thing too. You know, if you mm. know that you have somebody working with you, then your argument can be, yes, well, I'm going over here to work on this project and I'll check in. And they're, they're fully competent. And of course, if you are comfortable enough that you've let your boss know beforehand that they are also going to trust the person is competent, well, then look, you have win, 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 win all over the place. All over the place. That's it. I am so tired of people being threatened. It means that you are not developing yourself. You are not yeah. growing as well. And and so when you are a leader who really wants to do something and, and accomplish things, you are happy to hire people who are much better than you. Because there's a level of expertise and knowledge and intuition that you have that they will not have, you know, yeah. that you, 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 you can't, no matter how smart you are, that level of expertise and, and experience, mm -hmm. you know, we, when we talk about wisdom, we don't the wounds. Yes. <laughs> yes. so don't be threatened. So that was a really great point. Thank you. Um, Ellen said her leadership has changed and many supervisors, managers, CEOs, and employees don't realize that it has. It's the old, yes, it's so yeah. true. Driving change at the pace that change is happening today needs on appointed leadership, leadership from all points of the organization and not from an elite few. Yeah, that is so true. This is why employees are hiding their skills because, yes, you, you have to realize that it's at all levels and throughout the organization and not just siloed. However, there needs to be a communicated vision, a coached vision, a focus on possible opportunities and all presented in a way that employees want to do and not feel forced to do. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to our tribe, peeps. Yes, I love <laughs> these comments. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because this is what happens when you're preaching to the choir. And so what we need is more people who have this perspective and more people who are willing to take the responsibility to encourage this as the orientation in the organization. Because the problem is that leadership has changed. And why has it changed? Because the people you're leading have changed. There are people who are capable. There are people who are competent. And so they're frustrated by the old way of my way or the oh. highway. Um, they're frustrated I, with the old way of, well, you know, I'm the boss, so my idea is the best. Because you know mm. what? Sometimes it ain't. And I feel like those leaders need support. So you need to, you know, upskill them in, in mm. such a way that they can do it. You, you're, you're, you're taking leaders, they're, they're overwhelmed, they're not, well, the ones that are good and are working hard and trying really hard. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the ground beneath them has shifted. Mm -hmm. And unless you have taken it upon yourself as a good leader should be, you know, it's reflection and developing and growing to, um, you know, upskill yourself in this new world that we're in, then you are going to let, be left behind scrambling. And um, so it's really important that, again, I go back to the HR departments who, who are upskilling their leaders and giving them the tools necessary to be able to handle, as you say, this new workforce. If not, mm -hmm. you're going to be scrambling, just trying to hold on to your job. And that's why you feel threatened. You feel threatened because you're not prepared for who you're leading and, and you feel like people will expose you. And so if you, but if you get a good leader and I meet some who are so good, they, they, they throw their leaders into training and say, let's, let's discuss the hard challenges and how we are, we're going to approach this. Mm -hmm. And, and, and how do we do it? You know, I love working with those people because they, they're not sitting around waiting for something to go wrong. It's very proactive as mm -hmm. in it's changed. How do we lead? How do we lead bright, intelligent, driven people who frankly overwork themselves but want to know every year where am I going? How mm -hmm. do we lead those? How do we guide them? And that's the, the sort of um, what this sort of research is saying is that's what you need. 
today. Yeah. And yeah. it's telling you that there are a lot of those people out there and they're the ones who are suffering, quote unquote, under the leader who is not allowing them the opportunity to use what they're really capable of. And I know because I've had a few clients, people who contact me because they want to they want to shift in their career because what they're doing now, they're not able to use the skills that they have and the capabilities. So they're frustrated and they're not fulfilled. And so just to let you know, leaders, if you have people on your team that have skills and capabilities that they're not talking to you about and you're not creating an opportunity for, their to use, for them to use them, please note that they're out there polishing their resume and they're looking all right now. And you can't blame them because if yes. you cannot give them in the environment that they can thrive in, then it is almost your responsibility to help them go find an environment that they can grow and thrive in. Mm -hmm. Because if we have to look at the bigger picture, we have to look at the economy of the countries that we live in. We have to look at the fact that um, there, there has to be growth. There has to be innovation. There has to be somebody coming up with new ideas. And so if you're not in a position where you can make that happen because your organization doesn't have the structures, the systems, it isn't flexible enough and it can't change enough, those people are going to go somewhere where they have an opportunity to do have that. Have an opportunity, yeah. Oh, we just have another comment. Sometimes um, employees are not interested in a higher position because they appear stifling and restricted, not providing mm -hmm. any outlet for their talents. So true. And yeah. that is the, the employee of today. That That is where yes. everyone is needing that freedom. Yes. So that's yeah. why we say that the job crafting is so important because it's not like the, the upward tra trajectory isn't what they want. They want a fulfilling, meaningful role that gives them time to go home to their families. Uh, well, mostly remote in today's world. I was yeah. just, uh, Every time I talk to somebody, it's like nobody wants to come into your office. They need a hybrid or a remote model anymore. But they want, they want something that allows them to pursue other meaningful opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so this is the point, which is why job crafting is so, so critical to it. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you want, you have to pay um, employees everything. You just need to ensure that they're utilizing those skills that will give them a richer, deeper, meaningful mm -hmm. experience. And I had a client who says that, that um, who, who came to me and what was the problem? Bright, bright, driven people who were saying no to the higher positions. Yeah. And, and of course the answer, go, on, go ahead. <laughs> okay. What I was going to say, because it is important too, I think for leaders to remember that not everybody's motivated by money. There is still that assumption that because you're going into a higher position and you're going to get a bump in salary, that you automatically will want to take the position. But not everybody is motivated by that. Well, a they, lot of they people see the misery. value. Yes, <laughs> yeah. they value their quality of life. They value their peace of mind. And if they can find an opportunity to do fulfilling work at the level they're at, they're happy to be there without having to give up more of their personal time and they can still feel satisfied, engaged and productive where they are. So don't ever assume that just throwing money at the problem is going to solve it. That's it. Cause that was the answer. It's like, well, leadership mm -hmm. is going to have to look different. This, they looking at you and saying that you're working really hard. You have like 50 meetings a day. You're on, you're pressured. You, you really have time to recover. Nobody wants to be like you. Yes. <laughs> People are looking on and going, no. you know, and you know, like when we were, well, not saying that we aren't 20 anymore. Yes. But, but remember, when we were. <laughs> <laughs> remember when we read that statement that said, if you want to know what your life is going to be like in 10 years, look at your boss today. Mm -hmm. And if you want to become like them and continue, and if you don't, you got to get off this train. Do something different. You yeah. got to do something different and, yeah. and act differently. And I find that employees today there that's where they are and so yeah. you're not making these higher positions look interesting and exciting you you look burnt out overworked and stressed and you know you saying that made me remember we were doing a strategic planning project with an organization a regional organization and one of the things they wanted us to assess because they were concerned that the employees were just being overworked and they asked us to measure the employees um work time were they coming in 
on weekends where they're staying late after hours. And so how did they feel about that? And so we surveyed all the employees in the organization. And when the data came back, the people in the organization who were overworked, staying late, and coming in on weekend was management. Yes. Nobody else in the organization was yes. doing that. So management was concerned that the organization was just so stressed and so overworked because everywhere they look, but what it's, they did not it's realize you that's that they, all you. <laughs> they were the problem. Because then you know, the other complaint we, we were getting from employees is that they weren't, they didn't know what was going on and they felt like work was not being delegated to them. So that's why management was stressed and stretched and overworked. And stressed. You know, that's what we said. It's you who's all, you're who overwhelmed because, you know, when leaders come to say, oh, people are upset, you know, and, and they're stressed and they're anxious about this change. And it's like, no, you are because your people look to you. <laughs> So if your people are obsessed and stressed and anxious, then I know it's you. So let's start with you first, right? And and let's deal with it. And so your today's leaders are not giving a wonderful um like let's go up there and be a leader. Yeah. And they're not. So that's why I say they need help. We need to help our leaders. We need to give them more training, good training. Not where they come and just observe. They're observers and not participants. Mm -hmm. Where they're developing and, and and figuring out a skill to practice that will help them um, become better. That's mm -hmm. what you know they need to 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 really help. Because I, I'm not surprised. I I love the I really that that when you oh our people seem overworked. Oh, it's us. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. not our people it's we who are overworked because yeah that's that's it that's what most yeah. leaders are feeling and i i said that to some person i was coaching you know where they feel like this low grade sex that you're never going to get everything that you're supposed to be do to do done and it's like that's the norm that's just yeah. the norm today you're not and so you have to learn to operate in that environment and still be productive. It's like a leader yeah. who doesn't have all the information but still have to make decisions. You can't, yeah. you can't hem and haw. They yeah, but that's where, decisions. but that's where, as we were saying earlier, the redesign of jobs, the recrafting of jobs, redesign of work comes in. Whereas one of the things that they're talking about in the future of work is the fact that, and and this was in one of the other topic um, articles that we had used as a basis for a discussion mm -hmm. where they were saying that the way that work was going to change is that there are a lot of tasks right now that we consider must be done manually that really can be automated and it's just that we haven't our procedures right now our processes don't allow for it and we are not yet looking at it but as organizations go on and as you realize that people have higher value skills that they can bring into the organization we're going to have to start looking more closely at, well, how can I automate the repetitive tasks so that these people can engage their brain more? Because in the when, end, when that's you say what automation, I get, want. I get scared that you're like get, taking away jobs. Like that's the, the conditioned no, response. No, you see, that is yeah. the fear. You're right. That is a conditioned response. That is the fear that people have had for years. When we brought computers into the organization, they say once you had computers that they were going to fire half the staff. And they may have fired half the people they had who were using com who were using typewriters. But here's the thing: they hired new people who could use computers. And so, what happens? It means the skill, the skills that are required, are that's what changes. But it doesn't automatically mean that you use less people as part of your workforce. Instead, it means that you change the skills that you need within your workforce. But and you so have people to have want people to be relevant. Who they have are to keep who? up skilling who are willing to reskill because, you That's know, like it. if you just, yeah. So, and that, you know, one of our um, commenters was talking about um, people don't want to change because obviously when you go through the change, you, you come out of your comfort zone where you're an expert and you're mm -hmm. highly competent into mm -hmm. an environment where you're not. And, yeah. and people resist that very strongly. And if you don't have a good change management process where you shepherd them through that process, to say, hey, I know you feel that way, but soon you're going to be highly skilled. Then you know they 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 self select out, and then blame, you know the the system. Uh, the, the, the automation. So yes, I just wanted yeah. to mention that the moment you say automation, that that condition yeah. response is like, oh my god, yeah, 
you taking away jobs? Yeah. But it's really that that's just the start. They fill it, it's reskill people so that they can move. And that's particularly important for the Caribbean, I should say. Yeah. Um, the Caribbean and, and Latin American region. Well, it's really important for every single place. Um, but yeah, I just want But I think it is something that we are talking about more and more in the Caribbean because we do have a, a high rate of underemployment meaning mm -hmm. that we are we have people in jobs who have the capability to do more but the job does not require them to do more and so you do have people who get frustrated and who get upset they'll stay there for a while and as you say with the younger people who have more capability they'll take the job and three years in and sometimes it may be even less than three years they're frustrated they're bored and they're not sure what to do with the rest of their lives but yeah, they know that everybody... they're in it yeah, everybody wants something in two years. I mean, you 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 look around, especially. It's because um, it, if it's you like, think about it, you learn you learn the first year everything is new. The second year you're doing it, you're repeating it, so you you make improvements. So by the third year, you've done it twice, so you got it down now. So you're ready to go and learn something new. And, and, and if there's something. nothing new happening, and there's no nothing else being added on for you to learn, then you feel that you've learned everything there is. And in some jobs, remember, we say that the person has one. They work. They get one day, that's what it is. They have one day and they repeat it a hundred times. Uh, yes. Which is not, so that takes us, and we're going to end right back to where you say, yeah. so we, we discuss a lot about leaders. So what can the individual do? And I like what you're mm -hmm. saying is that you have to learn to take initiative and you mm -hmm. have to know when to take initiative because that's mm -hmm. important. <laughs> if not, yeah. you can find yourself in um, trouble. And so you have to, you know, I say this in my book, that your career is owned by you, aided by your employer. And so you are 100% responsible for your career. You can no longer walk into an organization today and say, I hand over your career to, for them to determine how you go anywhere. You have to take hold of it. And people are doing it, thank goodness, which is why they're having those discussions really mm -hmm. early. What do you want to do for me? I was watching a TikTok. On, a, on another platform today. I think it was a TikTok, but it, it was on Instagram where someone was saying things that make them, when they're interviewing, the questions they ask are, um, so give me a, a, a normal day in the life of some person here. And they say, well, we're really committed and you have to put your all in and they shut the computer down. <laughs> like, no, not, not going for you're not that. You're interested in putting your all in. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and that was an example. So it's uh, you have to take initiative. You have to know when to take initiative. Yeah. And I usually say to people, how do you know when you have to take an initiative? There are usually four things. When you know the answer to, to the, the solution to the problem that's happening, and um, it's worth the effort to you and the organization. We like the win-win situation. When it's within your area of expertise or authority, and you mm -hmm. have the ability to do that, um you weren't asked to do it but you have the right to do it that's the third thing that tells you you should take initiative and when it's supporting your organization or your team mm -hmm. then you should take initiative so those are the, those are the four um main indicators of hey this is something that i can take initiative here on and more people in organizations need to be taught that and and need to be given permission by the organization to say yes come on let's form a community let's take some initiative and do that more often i think to yeah. add on to what you said as well earlier yes and thank you and i agree with you now we are coming close to getting ready to wrap up now so um you mentioned your book so I just want to say, remind everybody your book, where to find it. Yes, my book, Workplace Anxiety, How to Refuel and Reengage. It's really about how to come out if you're feeling underappreciated, overworked and stressed, then my book is for you. It's needed more than ever now. And it can be found anywhere books are sold, Amazon, um, Apple, Barnes & Noble, etc. Mm -hmm. And you can find me here on LinkedIn or you can find me over on Instagram. And I am Sonia Gartside over on Instagram. All right. And then you mentioned the course that you've been you've done for a few people about how to take initiative. How if to anybody take anybody listening wanted to get that course done for their organization or wanted to do it for themselves, 
how would they how could they get that to happen how do they oh well they will just go to my website and send me a, a, a message or oh, send okay. me something here on linkedin yes okay. it's a course and i'll send you the outline um large you, you know organizations there? yeah do that and it's really it's a really good one for teams to take okay and i i think that 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 really brings us on a good note to end on the fact that we have employees out there in the world working in organizations who have skills that they may be willing to share with the organization, but it is up to leaders to be able to help them understand how to take the initiative, how to show those skills, when to show it. And so I believe that if we want to keep our nations growing, we want to keep our organizations growing, we have to be willing as leaders to step up and take responsibility for helping our employees to utilize those skills effectively. And any closing comments from you? No, I can't add to that. That was perfect. Oh, <laughs> what did they right. say? Chef's kiss. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. This discussion mm -hmm. this evening has been a rich one. And thank you very much for our comments and for your contributions from yes. those of you who joined us this afternoon. When you are watching this again, or if you're watching it in the recording and you have any additional comments that you want to make, please feel free to go ahead and add them to this post. We will also be willing to respond to any questions or comments that you leave for us. It has been a pleasure this evening to talk to you about this. It is another one of those important things that we as leaders in organizations need to focus on if we're going to help our organizations to become better and to grow consistently. So thank you very much for joining us and we will see you next time. See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>